Good afternoon. As I've been instructed, and our panelists will also um, help out by holding this microphone pretty close to your mouth so that it works properly. Um, we have endless trouble with the sound in Warren Auditorium. So I'm Myrna Goodman. I am the uh, director of the Center for the Study of the Holocaust and an emeritus professor in sociology with a career as the coordinator of this lecture series for about 12 years. Um, I want to introduce our panelists today. Uh, we're on a real tight timeline, so I plan to have a little timer go off. Um, if that doesn't work, where's the hook, Todd? But anyway, they have so much to share, and we've really limited them in the amount of time that they can uh, speak to you. So what I want to do now is introduce all of them, and then um, we'll start. Our first speaker will be Professor John Kornfeld. He's a Holocaust descendant whose parents escaped from Vienna, Austria in 1939. John earned his AB degree in English from Princeton University, his MA in education from Sonoma State, and his PhD in education from Indiana University. He taught elementary, middle, and high school for 16 years. Since 1996, he's been serving as a professor of education and associate vice president for undergraduate studies. Currently, in addition to teaching part-time at Sonoma State, he is president of the West County Health Center's board of directors. He has been married for nearly 40 years and has three grown children and two young granddaughters. Currently, in addition to... I say grandmothers? No, no, no. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the teacher. <laughs> yeah, my accent. That's okay, John. Currently, in addition to teaching part time at Sonoma State, he is president of West County Health Center's Board of Directors. Sanders Fellhorn is the next person. He is a Holocaust descendant whose father was incarcerated in Dachau in 1938 and later in Buchenwald. Eventually, through the efforts of his mother, Charlotte, his father was released and they were able to escape from Vienna. They immigrated to the United States in 1939 with his oldest brother. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in engineering from UCLA, an MA in deaf education from CSU Northridge and is a retired teacher of the deaf. When Sanders Feldhorn's father, Julius, was taken to Dachau, then to Buchenwald, his mother, Charlotte, traveled daily by train to Vienna, Austria, to Gestapo headquarters in Berlin. I don't know how many of you really know your geography, but that's quite a trip. Mm -hmm. uh, she did that for close to a year in order to beg for his release. Since Sanders' immediate family and most of his extended family are gone, he feels it is his responsibility to continue to tell the story of his family in memory of those who can no longer do so. In the middle, we have Christine Davidian. Christine is a third generation Armenian genocide survivor whose grandmother's aunt and several uncles survived by escaping on foot from Turkey in 1915. <coughs> Both of her grandfathers were working in the US to be able to get their threatened families out of Turkey but were unable to bring their wives and dozens of relatives here in time. Her grandmothers, both of whom had lost their husbands in the genocide, eventually made it to the United States and remarried. 
Christine founded the Armenians of the North Bay, the social organization, um, in 2002 to connect with her heritage, and she established the Armenian Genocide Memorial Lecture Fund at Sonoma State. So our Armenian lectures are supported by Christine's work. She's been uh, a board member with the Alliance um, that sponsors, helps sponsor the uh, lectures for 14 years and was board president for seven years. She speaks about her family's survival stories and the Armenian genocide in local Sonoma County schools and on behalf of the uh, um, Alliance's educational mission. In addition to that, she's a double certified procurement professional and currently works for Medtronic. Dennis Judd is a Holocaust descendant whose mother Lillian and father Emil were born in Czechoslovakia and were interned in Auschwitz during the World War II. Lillian spoke to thousands of students in Sonoma County before her death in 2016. Dennis co-wrote a book with Lillian, From Nightmare to Freedom, Healing After the Holocaust. He has a bachelor's and a master's degree in environmental health and industrial hygiene from Cal State Northridge. And last but not least, Elaine Leader is Dean Emerita of Social Sciences and Professor Emerita of, of Sociology at Sonoma State. She has 42 years experience as a teacher, scholar, and social activist. She has written six books and has received awards for working in prisons, as well as having been a visiting scholar at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Currently, she does victim and offender dialogues with prisoners and the families of their victims. Dean Leader, who was instrumental in creating, creating the Erna and Arthur Salm Holocaust and Genocide Memorial Grove on the Sonoma State campus, is the child of a Holocaust survivor from Lithuania. I want to thank you for your attention, and now we're going to start with our panel, and the first person to speak will be John Cornfield. Can you hear me? Okay, thanks. Uh, just so that you know, I'm not checking my text messages. I am simply keeping an eye on the time here. So, exactly. So, um, first of all, since I'm first, I thought it would be important to think about some themes that will probably carry through on all of these presentations. Uh, one of them, as you could already see, has to do with response to trauma. That is, what happens to families when you have a uh, parent or parents who have experienced deep trauma? What's the impact? And you're going to get a number of different uh, responses to that. And the second, and it's pretty closely related, is the whole idea of memory. You know, what happens if you, uh, if a memory, if you don't want to have a memory, should that memory be just let go? Should it be forgotten? Or is it somebody's responsibility to hold on to that memory? Um, and for me, a family secrets is a big part of what I'm going to talk about. So just a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in Los Angeles. I had a wonderful relationship with my parents, both of whom were Holocaust survivors. Uh, I still have a great relationship with my brother. And my parents were part of a circle of friends, all of whom were um, survivors. Um, all refugees from Austria. Now, they would not have considered themselves survivors because to them, survivors were people who had been in the camps, and they hadn't. Uh, so to them, I think they saw themselves just as, or they claimed to see themselves as Jews who had escaped Hitler and chose to be near one another. They laughed a lot. Uh, they reminisced a lot about Vienna and their lives before the war, but nothing ever about the Nazi takeover of Austria, uh, nothing about their journeys from Austria to the shiny linoleum world of Los Angeles in the 1950s. Now, I knew my parents' story. Was, I can tell it to you in a minute. Um, they had happy, carefree childhoods. You can see my parents together and 
also in their uniforms. They had happy, carefree childhoods. Both were middle class. They had fathers who were, uh, who were merchants. Um, and then when Hitler took over Austria, that was their term, took over, they knew they had to get out. And they spent the next year and, and, and a half getting out or trying to get out. And eventually they got exit visas uh, to England. My father continued on to the US. He joined the US Army. My mother in England uh, joined the, um, the British Army as a nurse. Uh, neither was sent overseas. They ended up in England. And that's where they fell in love and got married in, in in 1944. And my mother told it, told the story of the war as a love story. It, she had these very romantic memories of the Blitz in London, of falling in love with my father, as she said, with the bombs falling all around them. Now, as for their parents, you can see my mother's parents up there. Um, they're on the far left. They didn't make it. Uh, my father's parents did make it. And I knew that not making it meant that they'd been victims of Hitler's genocide, but my parents never made a big deal of it. They didn't make it. That was the end of it. And that's pretty much it. I didn't think about it that much growing up. Once or twice in my years growing up, my dad would say something like he once said um, that he'd hidden in a dumbwaiter. I said, well, why did you hide in a dumbwaiter? He said, oh, the Nazis. And that was it. And I didn't ask for follow-up. Um, and I wonder about that a lot. Why didn't I? And I think I know the reason, and you'll see the reason. There were very rigid rules of engagement in our family. You never asked your, my parents for information about their life after the Anschluss, after the annexation of, of Austria, and, uh, and I never broke those rules. Well, that's not true. I broke the rules three times, and I'm going to actually tell you the three times I broke the rules. The first one was um, when I was about 13, maybe about 20 years after the start of, <clears throat> since the end of the war, and my mother got a letter just out of nowhere from a friend. Her name was Gardy. She had been my mother's best friend growing up in school, but they had lost track of one another during the war. Um, that happened a lot. You would lose track, you'd look for them after the war, and if you found them, wonderful, they made it. If you didn't find them, they hadn't made it. Well, Gardy, it turns out, had made it. She had escaped to Shanghai um, and married a Jewish man there. And then eventually she hired a private detective, found my mother, and then she wrote this letter to my mother. And my mother, I'd never seen her like this before. She was dancing around the house saying, Gardy made it, Gardy made it. And my mind was racing because she had lost track of her parents, right? And so I asked the question, well, maybe your parents made it. And it was like I had punched her in the gut. She just stopped dead. And she just said in this terrible voice, no. And I persisted. I said, well, how do you know? They could have gone to uh, uh, South America, maybe Australia. There are Jews who escaped everywhere. She said, I know. And she's, I'm chasing her out of the room at this point. And she, uh, I, I, I say, well, how do you know? She said, I got a card. What, you got a card? What, a postcard? No, a card in my mother's handwriting. And the, her voice was just so terrible, as, and, but I persisted. And um, I said, well, how did it get to you? She said, it got to me. And well, I said, what did it say? She said, it said, we're on a train to nowhere. We're starving, we're dying, and just left the room. And that was, and that was it. I knew never, I mean, I had sent my mother to such a terrible place that I knew not to, not to ever do that again. And I didn't for about 20 years. Um, and then I broke the rules again. It was 1989. I was, a I was 36 years old. I was a classroom teacher at Monorail School down on the Russian River. And um, I got a notice in my mailbox that Bruno Bettelheim was going to be speaking at Sonoma State. Now, Bettelheim was a well-known child psychologist. I thought, great, I can get some great ideas. Headed over to Sonoma State, Warren Auditorium right here. And of course, when I get in there, I realize, oh, he's not going to actually be talking about child psychology. He's talking about the Holocaust. This was part of this series in 1989, which I hadn't heard of. And uh, he was talking about the Holocaust. And what he was talking about was families of survivors. And he talked about parents who take all of their loss and all the horror they experienced and humiliation and anger and everything else, and they just didn't tell their children anything. They didn't want to hurt their children, so they told them nothing. And they 
would, and he didn't say this about all survivors, but he said in actually in functional families, this, it can work like this, and they take all of those, those uh, that bad stuff and they put it in a box, and they put that box in the back of their brain and they never, ever open that box. But the, and I'm, I'm driving home now after this, this speech and I'm thinking to myself, huh, I wonder if there are some things that my parents haven't told me because I don't know anything. So I get home, call my parents up. As always, they get on speakerphone. And so I told him I saw Bruno Bettelheim here, Sonoma State. And he said, you know, that often parents want to shield their children from the really terrible things they've experienced. I said, you know, don't, don't worry about me. I need to know. Could you please tell me some, tell me things that you haven't told me? Are there things you're leaving out? Well, what do you think they said? They said nothing. I mean, you could hear the hum of the telephone line at the other end. And I asked the question again, nothing. And it took me an uncomfortable minute for the light bulb to go on and for me to realize, oh, that's what Bettelheim was talking about. They're not going to tell me, and I'm not going to be able to drag it out of them. So I changed the subject. I said, you know, how was your weekend? Oh, we went out with the Mullers. We uh, went on a picnic. It was wonderful. It was as if I had never asked the question. And, but, and I knew I wasn't going to get anything out of them, but I also knew that I needed to find out some things. And that's when I started on my own search. Uh, the first step was really just to study the history. And it wasn't as available as it is today with the internet. Pictures, I mean, all of the things, you know, the train to nowhere started making sense when you saw pictures of the cattle cars. I learned more about the, the takeover of, of, of Austria. And I found myself thinking, my parents were there when Hitler marched in, when the sky was blackened by, by the airplanes. And, you know, what? imagine that happening in my own world. And they were there during Kristallnacht. What happened? Where were they? And all of these questions. But I knew not, I couldn't ask them. How was I going to find out? Well, I got lucky. Um, a couple of years later, I was visiting my aunt, my father's oldest sister, who lived in London. And she pulled up. She was working on something. And she said, take a look at this. And she, she pulled out the fa a family tree she was working on. And this is just a little part of it, because I found myself focusing on my father's generation and my grandfather's generation. And there were all of these dates of death, 1942 question mark. And I said to her, what's with the question mark? She looked at me like I was some kind of idiot. And she said, they were lost. We don't know what happened to them. In the camps, probably. And this is just, here you see one generation, three didn't survive into the war. And of the, of the six remaining, four were, uh, were lost in the war. So I said to her something like, what was it like? I mean, it must have been awful. What was it like? And she turned to me and said, you know, I have been waiting your whole life for you to ask me that question. So I started getting some information out of her. Not a lot, because it was very painful. It was very painful. But um, she told me some things. She told me about things like you've all read about, scrubbing sidewalks, sexual assault. She told me about my father. It was Kristallnacht that my father hid in the dumbwaiter for 24 hours while the, uh, while the Nazis were searching their house, right? 24 hours. And so, um, you know, the more I learned, the more I needed to learn. And it was, as we were talking before, like the weight of it just, even though every, with every new bit of information, I just felt this weight, but also this compulsion to know because it's going to be f lost when they're gone. And I felt really alone, uh, which is amazing because there are, were so many people engaged in the same search, which I eventually found out about, but not my brother. He really was not interested in going there, but other friends, uh, uh, children of my parents' friends, they, they, some of them might, might be engaged in the same search as I was in. So that was great, but it didn't relieve this sense of just feeling like the weight of the world was on me. And suddenly I remembered a book that uh, students read in elementary and middle school called The Giver. Are any of you familiar with it? The Giver is this kind of dystopia about a, um, 
this society where the adult, where people, nobody feels anything. They're actually drugged so that they don't feel anything. That no highs, no lows, no joy, no sadness, no anger. But um, there's one person whose job is, whose role is to be the receiver of memory. He's the giver because he's giving the memories to a boy who is overwhelmed as these memories start weighing on him. And I thought to myself, was Lois Lowry, who, the author, she's Jewish, was she thinking about people like me? So I sent her an email uh, asking her that, and I got a, an answer back the next day, and she said, well, no, I wasn't thinking of that, but that's interesting. And this is what she wrote, and I want to read what she wrote. She said, it seems to me, oddly, both a gift and a burden that you've been given. And I think that my character, the man that I called the giver, would feel the same way. He says at one point that his pain comes from the loneliness of the memories, that memories need to be shared. I think your parents carried a grief that could not speak, and so you and others like you in your situation are both burdened and gifted with putting words to their sorrow. And that was when I decided it was time for me to start talking to school groups. I got three minutes, right? To school groups about my parents <coughs> and my family. So I want to actually finish with a little bit about my, my grandparents, uh, who you see up there, who were, who were lost in the Holocaust. And um, I was so grateful when Elaine Leder spearheaded the Holocaust Memorial because it gave me a place to put, my, my, put them down. And I got a brick, and they're there now. And um, I actually put their dates of death as 1942 question mark in honor of um, of that uh, timeline where I first really got a true sense of, of what um, they had undergone. But when, when we were there for the inaugural event, actually, Myrna saw that. I don't know if you remember this. And she said, you know, why do you have a question mark? You could, you, you, you could find out the dates. And I, what I said, there wasn't time to explain. I said, well, I, you know, I'm, ha I'm happy with it the way it is. But now you know the reason. The reason is because it's the connection to me. But um, my parents were still alive when the memorial went up. They were in Los Angeles and very elderly in their 90s. And I didn't tell them that I had that brick made. And I debated with myself, do I step over the line? Do I give, create this pain in them, and just bring it all up or not? Well, I decided I just couldn't not tell them. So I called them up and told them about the brick and again, I got the silence, just dead silence. And I'm thinking to myself, I, I can't believe I did this again. I have just, again, just stabbed them in the heart and just opened up that box. And uh, I was just ready to change the subject when my mother started speaking really low, and it was as if it, the words were being sort of pulled out of her. And she said, you know, your father's parents survived the war. They died as elderly people in England, and they, um, they have a place. When I've gone there, I've visited them, I've seen their names, I've seen, seen it on the plaque, and I think to myself, my parents are nowhere. When I'm gone, they're going to be forgotten. And she said, now, now there is a place where they will be remembered. So I thank you. And so what I want to say to you is, when you go to the Holocaust Memorial, Look for the 1942 question mark, and you'll know that it's my grandparents, and you will also be part of remembering that they were lost in the Holocaust. So thank you very much. Thank Hello. Yeah. I think John and I are going to have to have a conversation because <laughs> so many of the things that he, he mentioned are, are common to my family. And my mother used to say, um, because I used to ask her if she would be willing to go and tell her story to schools or to the Spielberg project and so forth, and she would say, you know, my story is like everybody else's, which is true in a sense, but of course it's also not true. Every story is unique, but there is some commonality. And, you know, when I was listening to John, it's like, oh my God, we'd, 
we're too much alike. I, I, I want to compare notes after this. Well, I'm going to have to practice my speed talking because I, I'm used to having an hour, hour and a half to tell my story. Uh, and I've also learned um, as a classroom teacher, um, well, to give you an example, the first 18 years of my career, I taught deaf students at the California School for the Deaf. And then when I moved to Santa Rosa for a few years, I taught hearing students at L.C. Allen High School. And the very first week of teaching hearing students, I totally lost my voice. And that's when I realized I probably talk too much. So, you know, that's, that's how it is. But, you know, in, in some ways, perhaps it serves me well. So I want to just touch briefly on the reason that I feel obligated to tell the story of my family. And it's simply this, and it's, a, it's an obvious thing. This is not going to come as a surprise. My older brother was born in October of 1938, uh, while my father was in Dachau. And he passed away in 2015 at the age of 76. So if he were still alive today, he would be 80 years old. My mother, on the other hand, passed away in December of 2016 at the age of 102. So now, obviously, when the Holocaust began, if we assume that the Holocaust began 1938, there's, you know, I would question that, but let's say 1938, she was about 24 years old. So she had a very clear memory, whereas obviously my older brother did not. He was a baby. Um, but that's really the range of survivors. So 80 to 102, actually my mother would be 104 if she was still, still alive. That's the age range. So that age range is obviously dwindling quickly. 10 years, 20 years, there will be none left. So to me, my obligation is to tell the story because these stories are, are being forgotten. I mean, thank God for the Spielberg Project and other things like that, that those stories are preserved to some extent. But of course, as the survivors die, the rise of Holocaust denial is equally rising at the same rate. And when all the survivors are gone, who are going to be able to go up to these people and say, no, you're lying? Well, it's up to us as the second generation to at least say, we heard the stories firsthand. Yeah, we're telling them secondhand. But the more we tell them, the more witnesses we create. And that's what I tell my students when I go to the schools and I, I tell these stories. I say, you all are witnesses now. And I expect when someone comes up to you, as surely they will someday, and say, this did not happen. Or maybe even worse, it's exaggerated. Or God forbid, it's fake news. I want you to say to them, oh, no, 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 I saw this guy and his parents went through it and they were there and they told him and I believe that it happened. So that's what I feel like. That's why I do this. Now, in terms of the common story, my parents also grew up in Vienna. However, while my mother was born in Vienna, my father was actually born in Galicia, which you may or may not know is a region, doesn't exist anymore as a discrete region, but it may, more or less straddles Poland and Ukraine. And the reason it's important that he was born in this little town that literally changed countries every few weeks. Some mornings he'd wake up and he would be in Poland. Other mornings he'd wake up, he'd be in Ukraine. You never knew which country were you in. You know, it was as if you woke up one morning and someone said, oh, we're in Oregon now. Oh, that's cool. But in fact, the fact that on the day that my father was born, his little town was in Poland, was one of the reasons why he ended up surviving. My mother, on the other hand, who was born in Vienna, her parents were from Romania. Now, some of you might be familiar with the fact that the, in the United States, immigrants were allowed to come in based on a quota system. So if you were born in one country, the quota might be full. You, co you couldn't come over. If you were born in another country, you could, and because of that, when my family members started trying to get out of Europe, unfortunately, the Romanian quota in the United States was full, and as a result, pretty much my mother's entire family was wiped out, including her father. Now, when my parents got out, her father was still alive, and he had not been arrested yet. And of course, he was trying desperately to get out, and he felt like he would get out eventually. Um, but he was aiming for the United States, and uh, time ran out. And he was eventually arrested, taken to a concentration camp, and, and as far as I can tell from my research, taken out and shot. 
So it was just that quota that resulted in his demise. Again, because my father was born in this little town of Galicia, when my mother finally was able to get him out of Buchenwald, his second concentration camp, the Polish quota was not full. And so he was able to get out. Now, long before that, my father was trying to convince his family and my mother's family to get the hell out because it was getting worse and worse and worse. And in fact, he earned the nickname Crazy Julius. Oh, Crazy Julius says we have to get out. Nobody really believed him. But eventually, fortunately, he was able to convince his parents and his two sisters to get out. And so they did get out safely. And several of his other relatives also did. Many did not, of course. Um, but it was too late for him. So he was arrested, taken first to Dachau. That's their wedding picture. Nice looking couple. You can see where I get my good looks. So that was in December of 1937. So shortly thereafter, um, my father was taken to Dachau. In June of 1938, now if you're a student of history, you know that that's several months before Kristallnacht. So to say again that the Holocaust began that day, no, it did not begin that day. It, it began way before that. In fact, my mother, while, and, and you, it's funny, you said something very similar. My mother spoke of Vienna very glowingly. Now she hated the Austrians in general. And let's be honest, Hitler was Austrian. But Vienna was like, was heaven, oh, it's so beautiful, which of course it, it was. Um, now, I went to Vienna only once, which was in 1973. To me, it was a horror show, because everywhere we went, my parents would point, oh, that's where we saw the Nazis shoot somebody to death. Oh, you see that window? That's where they threw the guy out to his death. Oh, here we saw some children gunned down. That was, that's like all we heard. Not only that, but we heard the Austrians themselves speaking about us inches away from us, assuming, oh, the American tourists won't understand our German, saying, oh, look, the Jews are coming back. Wasn't it nice when we could shoot them dead in the street? So the, the anti-Semitism in 1973 was ripe. And of course, again, if you're a student of history, you know Kurt Wildheim, who ran for chancellor of Austria. Um, his opponent discovered that he had, uh, had a Nazi past, thinking that he would then easily win the election. No, 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 Wildheim's popularity soared, and he won easily. And I'll tell you something, it's still there. It's still very powerful, much more so than Germany, by the way. Germany has taken steps to atone for their past. Austria has not done so. Uh, we had to fight with them to get reparations, and that's a whole other story. So they were married. My father was taken in June of 1938. My mother was already pregnant. He was arrested in their apartment by a guy that he actually went to school with. Guy came, knocked on the door. Julius Feldhorn, you, uh, yeah, oh, I remember you. You were in my class. You were the dumbest kid in the class. And he says, Julius Feldhorn, you must come with me. Well, I'm not coming with you. Get out of my apartment. And he put his hand on my father's shoulder. Now, my father was good at a lot of things, but keeping his mouth shut was not one of them. He was also a former boxer. He knocked the guy's arm away. And at that point, he whistled. Three or four soldiers ran up the stairs, beat my father up, and dragged him off. And that was the last my mother saw of him for close to a year. And, and as Myrna mentioned during that year, she went daily, pregnant, to Gestapo headquarters, begging for my father's release. Now, because he was taken early, it was possible to get out. It was possibly released if you could prove that you were able to leave immediately and you could find a country that would take you. So that takes, took some doing. My mother had to find a distant cousin who was living in New York to be the sponsor. But again, going every day to Gestapo headquarters trying to get my father out. Now, the notion of survival as being due to bravery or cunning or, or whatever, I dispute that. For the most part, people survive because they're lucky. My father survived because he was born in this little town that changed countries. My mother was able to get my father out of Buchenwald. Why? Because she didn't look Jewish. She was like the Aryan ideal. She had platinum blonde hair, blue eyes, light skin. In fact, when the Gestapo officer signed the release paper, he said to her, do you know why I'm signing this? And she says, I have no idea, man. I've been coming here for a year. And he said, I'm signing it because you remind me of my daughter. And sure enough, there was a picture on the desk that looked a little like my mother. 
So that's how, after all that time, my mother was finally able to get my father out. Of course, they got the hell out as, as quickly as they could. Now, before my father was taken, of course, he lost everything. They took away his furniture store. He had a very successful furniture store in Vienna, Mibblehaus Feltorn. Your family probably shopped there. It's very nice. We actually visited it when we went to Vienna. Of course, it's a different store now, but if you look carefully at the new sign, you can see just the outline of Feldhorn. It's like, yes. So um, anyway, so the loss of store, he was taken to the camps, and the rest, as you know. Um, and he, he went through a great deal in, and it's funny, when he was in Dachau, and I'm not sure why he even said this, he said there was a saying, they would say, you know, Dachau is bad, but at least we're not in Buchenwald. And of course, after four months, Buchenwald. And Buchenwald, he, he actually um, witnessed the infamous Ilse Koch, who became well known to, for supposedly making lampshades out of human skin. Um, there, there's a story about prisoners being lined up one day because something had been stolen and the guards had, had ordered them to, whoever was responsible for the theft, to step forward and confess. Yeah, good chance. So they were made to stand for hours and hours and hours, and finally the guards came and said, no one's confessing, fine. Count, starting on this end of the row, one to four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Okay, all the number fours take two steps forward, follow me, they walk off. Well, the rest of the men assumed that they were gonna be sent back to the barracks, they were envious, oh, I wish I was number four, so forth and so on. After a few more hours, they finally released all the men. They went to the barracks, and the other men who had been released weren't there. Come to find out, they had all been shot. And of course, the question that is in the minds of my students when I tell that story is, what number was your father? Well, he was number three. So again, you know, it's luck. He stands in one spot, you're alive. Another spot, you're dead. So I think that's the three-minute thing. Uh, let me just quickly tell a couple other stories of uh, other relatives, and, and, and these are all my father's side. Like I said, my mother's relatives were mostly wiped out. Uh, one of my father's relatives um, was, um, her name was Augusta Feldhorn, and she and her family decided to flee to Belgium because at that time Belgium was safe, um, and it was, it was fine for a little while, but of course eventually the Nazis took Belgium as well, and they ended up um, hiding Augusta in a, a convent and the, the parents hid with some friends. Well, one day the mother went out to get milk. She came back and the house was surrounded by Nazi soldiers. So she ran and hid in the convent with Augusta, posing as a nun. Uh, later found out that Augusta's father, who was also named Julius Felter, and same as mine, um, and uncle and aunt were taken to Auschwitz and killed. So, um, Augusta hid in the convent with her mother for the next three years. Uh, during that time, she developed tonsillitis, and because they couldn't take her to the doctor or hospital to have her tonsils removed, one of the nuns took them out. No anesthetic, no nothing. So she was lucky to survive even that. Um, eventually, uh, Augusta went out for a walk one morning, ran into a soldier who she assumed was going to shoot her dead, but it turned out to be an American soldier telling her that the war was over, at which point she fainted. Um, my favorite story, hopefully I have enough time to tell it, um, my father had an uncle also named Julius Feldhorn. My family was not very creative with names. And so um, after my parents were already uh, safe in the United States, they didn't know what happened to Uncle Julius. But one night, very late at night, two in the morning, the phone rings, and my father answers the phone. It's a woman. She says, your name is Julius Felton. Yes, it is. Uh, is there another Julius Felton? Well, I had an uncle. Oh, listen, I got to tell you. I went to the movies tonight, and there was a newsreel. You know, some of you who are young don't know that there was no CNN or Fox News then. People got news from the newsreel that they showed before the, the movie. And she said they, there was a scene where they liberated a concentration camp, and I think I saw your uncle. So he got up and started to dress. My mother said, what the hell? I'm going to the movies. Oh, you're drunk. <laughs> so he goes to the movies, not pounds on the door. It's like 3 in the morning. Guy pokes his head out of the window. What do you want? I want to see the movie. You're nuts. Go home. No, no. Here. Took out a $20 bill. Guy let him in. Turn on the, the projector. Watch the newsreel. He says, hey, stop, stop. Went up to, he says, I want you to cut the film. I'm not going to cut it. Here's another. He cut the film. Next day, he took that little piece of film to the photo lab, blew it up, and sure enough, there was Uncle Julius. And that's the only way that they knew that he had survived. They found that he'd been taken for some reason to a refugee camp in Venezuela, 
but they were able to bring him to the United States, and he had a good long life after that. So that's in a nutshell. I still have a voice. Okay, I'm done. So tell me when I start, Myrna, so I know I'm starting at zero. <laughs> well, I'll get going while you're doing that. I want to thank everybody. Uh, well, actually, I want to thank um, uh, Diane and, and Myrna for allowing me to be on this panel. Um, it's, it's a privilege to be here. and an honor because um, I never would have dreamed that I'd ever be up here um, as an Armenian and calling myself an Armenian genocide survivor. We just didn't think that growing up at all. Um, I'm from Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, as you can probably tell from my accent. And um, Worcester was the very first US Armenian community in the US. So I come from the town that probably has the most history of all of the Armenians that came to this country. And in fact, very ironically, a mile from where I grew up is Clark University, where Professor Tanner Aksham is now um, a professor doing research right now to prove without a doubt uh, the Armenian genocide did exist. He just published a book called The Killing Orders. Uh, so it's, it's ironic that he's actually right there up the street from us growing up. So I heard partial stories. I didn't hear a lot of stories growing up. Not a lot was discussed as what was common here and this theme here. Um, and so what I'm going to try to do is tell you some things that I do know, um, but it's certainly not everything. Um, it start with my grandfathers. Both of my grandfathers were in this country before the genocide. That was common of a lot of Armenian men that came, especially to Massachusetts and, and Providence, Rhode Island, and that area. They came before the genocide because they understood their families were threatened. They knew the impending doom. And they wanted to come to this country. They knew it was a place to come to make money and try to get their families out in time. And they never made it back, none of them and they didn't save their families. Um, and it's funny how some of the information that I'm gonna tell you is something that I just learned this weekend. My brother had information he never told me that was told to him, and like, what is with the secrets? I really don't know, but I guess it's just hard to pass that information on. Um, my, grand, my father's father, um, so by the way, I'm a third generation, so I'm the granddaughter of my grandparents who survived the genocide. Um, my, father's, my father's father um, lost at least one brother in the early massacres in the 1890s, they're called the Hamidian massacres. And so they understood and knew that, he understood and knew that it was a problem. Actually, oh yeah, there he is, my grandfather is on the, the left right there. And um, he had planned to go back and save his family, uh, but he lost about 50 of his family members. All that was left was a, a, a nephew, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit, some cousins. My brother just told me that in 1914, he had um, packed a suitcase, ready to go, but couldn't go because World War I broke out. And apparently, that suitcase was sitting in my grandmother's closet until she passed away in 1978. Never even knew that. The suitcase was still there. Uh, he had died years before. He was a lot older than my grandmother at the time. Um, so uh, my other grandfather was also here in this country. He was in Providence, Rhode Island. And he lost his wife, but for some reason, his son survived, who was a generation older than my mother. It would have been her half-brother. We don't know. I have no idea. Never heard the story. Don't know why he survived, how we got married and came to this country. But I do know that both grandparents, um, grandfathers came, that were here, eventually remarried my grandmothers here. My mother's mother made it to Aleppo. Again, we don't know how she made it there. She lived in a town called Paulo, where actually my grand, my grandfather, her husband, was from. Paulo was a lot of Armenians were there. Was sort of south, sort of south 
eastern sort of Turkey, if you remember kind of the map from um, Sergio Laporta's ex, um, uh, lecture. Um, she had to have gone through Syria. I, otherwise, I, we just don't know how she ended up in Aleppo, which is Syria. So how she made it through the desert, we have no idea. She was apparently there 10 years before she came to this country, and we believe that her marriage was arranged to my grandfather at the time. That's all I know about her. She never spoke at all. My, um, this is more new information that I learned. My father's mother's, almost the entire family, survived, which I didn't realize how that happened. It happened because her father, my great-grandfather, Boros Uzunyan, he was apparently um, in charge of the town, which is called Mamsa, and he was also the tax collector. And he knew in 1915 bad things are going to happen. He got everybody out of that town. And he got them out with the help of the, it's, the town, the area was called Dersim. And that was around where Kharpet is. The new name of that town is called Tincelli. There were Kurds there up there called Zazas. Again, I had never known about this. They're called Zazas. And those Zazas, they were Kurds. They helped the Armenians escape instead of killing the Armenians, which many Tur Kurds had done at the time. They also took and pa parents left some of their children with the Zazas. And according to my uncle who had survived, one of the children that had survived, told my brother one time that they did their best to try to keep the Armenian identity with these children, which kind of blows me away today. He knows this information from a woman who was a Kurd, who was a Zaza, who was doing a PhD uh, in, at Harvard and told him all this information. Otherwise, he would have not known any of this information. So um, the other thing he learned was there was sort of an underground railroad and they survived kind of going through this underground railroad all the way up, going north through Erzinga and then Erzurum and then north into um, Yerevan and Tiflis, which is again all the way up north. And I think I've, most of my relatives that survived were the ones that went north. The ones that went south pretty much did not survive, except for my grandmother. So um, the other thing I learned about my grandmother, she worked for <laughs> General Antranik, which was a huge hero and helped to save a lot of Armenians during the genocide. And as a matter of fact, he's buried in Chico, of all places, right? She gave him a gun, which doesn't usually happen, a gun, and she had a gun and a donkey, and my aunt, who was two years old, and went north. And the story that I like to tell about um, uh, my aunt, uh, my, my grandmother and my aunt was two years old at the time. She told my aunt, who never told the story until she was 92 years old, but finally she said, I'm so tired of the Jews talking about the Holocaust, I want to go and talk about the Armenian Genocide at 92. She finally started opening up and started going to the high schools, told the story that her, grandma, her mother told her, we got to a river. When I got to the river, all these mothers were throwing their babies in the river. And she said, I looked at you, and I thought about it. I looked at the river, I looked at you, and then I decided, I just can't do it. You're going to have to come with me. And that's how my, grand, my aunt was saved, and she lived to be 100 years old, and 92 to tell the story. Um, they were throwing the babies away. If you can imagine, why would they be throwing the babies away? A, they didn't know they were going to survive. They didn't know what would be the welfare, what would be the welfare of their children. They also didn't want their children taken as slaves or orphans into Muslim families and, and, and turned into Muslims. So they felt the better thing to do was to put them to their death because they weren't sure what was going to happen to them. OK, the other thing, um, my grandmother never told a lot of stories, but one saying that she would always say, always hit me, always kept in my brain, was nothing is sweeter than water. She used to say that all the time. and. It impressed me because it's like, you know, we're kids growing up, you know, we're young kids growing up, all kinds of soda and juices and milk and all this kind of stuff, but nothing is sweeter than water. Because for her, that's what kept her alive. Um, and the talk about the memorial, um, it's in the memorial. My, my st stone there is for my grandmother with that saying, nothing is sweeter than water. So I really um, think that I, I um, owe that to her to have some sort of a memory. Um, how am I doing on time? Oh my gosh, okay. I'm going to have to. What? What? 
Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So uh, there's another memorial that I have. My uncle Hachiku was my father's nephew that survived. He went all the way across, he went north, went all the way across to Vladivostok, pre pre pretty much all around the world. When he got there, there were a bunch of Armenians. Nobody had passports. Somehow there was an Armenian woman who was a diplomat in Yokohama, Japan, found out about the Armenians with outrage. No, the Armenians couldn't go anywhere. She got them Japanese passports. Most of them came to this country and ended up in Angel Island, which was like the Ellis Island of the West Coast. He, however, went back. She sent him back to the Middle East. We still don't know why she did that, but he um, he ended up at a British Red Cross camp that shut down, and then he was on his own again, found my grandfather, and then came to this country. He also has a brick um, in Morley's, because nobody really knew anything about his story, and the only reason why I knew about this whole story was that, that the woman, Diane Apcard's granddaughter, lives in San Francisco and did a film, otherwise I never would have known that the connection, because his was the only story that I knew on the East Coast. Um, growing up, I grew up in an Irish Catholic neighborhood. My feelings growing up was I look different than everybody else. Look at my hair, doesn't, doesn't look Irish Catholic, right? It wasn't until the civil rights movement and all of a sudden we could all have afros, yay. Um, but we grew up, I grew up feeling insignificant, worthless. I'm actually feeling a little bit on this panel because your story's more important. And that's how it felt growing up. We had no country at the time, there was no Armenia. Um, there was no, it was a strange culture, it was a strange language, we had a strange church. Um, we were different because of the genocide, but nobody talked about it. Um, it wasn't until I was a junior high school that I wrote a short story, and my teacher actually read it out to my horror to everybody in the class, and then after that, nobody talked to me after that, and I never understood that. Um, we were given ID bracelets growing up, and we had to pick a religion, Catholic, Protestant, or Jewish, and my sister and I go, well, we're not any of them. So we had to put P, because we didn't know any better. Again, these feelings of insignificance were, were terrible. Um, we're always looking for Armenians everywhere, because it's, it's our way of saying, we've got to find out, are we still alive? We go to movie theaters. Every Armenian sits at the end of every movie. We look at the credits to see, is there an I-A-N at the end of any name? And I actually, before I came to the Alliance, I went through the whole Sonoma State phone book, I mean Sonoma County phone book looking for IANs and I highlighted them all and that was one of the ways of starting the Armenians of the North Bay because I wanted to connect with my people. Um, almost over, um, okay, so um, I felt also smothered by two lives. It was important to be Armenian first because we have to stay alive. Um, American second, and it was just too much pressure. I, I had to like live a life, I had to go someplace and be on my own to start my professional life. Um, but I sort of went into denial, but that cloud just to follow me everywhere where I went. And I had just a hard time relaxing. I just wanted to be like a normal American, like Armenians don't go camping, right? We don't camp. But Americans do, you know? So the first time I did this, wow, that was great. Our people just didn't want to do that growing up. Um, started my family, began feel, feeling the missing and the responsibility to my people who their stories needed to be told. Because growing up, I don't think that the survivors had respect. My father was always yelling at my grandmother. There's always this tension, and that big Sonia movie helped me to understand what the yelling was all about. It was about the PTSD that was passed on and the trauma, and my grandmother would just look at him like, are you kidding me? I left with a donkey and a gun, and I work for you know General Andrenik, and you're sitting here yelling at me, right? So I feel um, a responsibility to respect and honor them, not feel ashamed for who they were, and by having those bricks, it really makes a really big difference. Um, and um, the memorial bricks, I'll never forget. I called my dad and said, hey, we have an opportunity to put these bricks. Didn't give me a red cent. I had to do it all myself. So if you go there and you see the Armenian bricks for nothing is sweeter than water and my uncle who traveled around the world, that's my way of saying they're respected and they're honored. Thank you. Thank you for 15 seconds. Okay, I'm Dennis Judd, and um, my, my parents uh, grew up in, the, um, in Czechoslovakia. It was in the Carpathian 
mountain region of Czechoslovakia, so it was the furthest east. And um, my dad was born in a small village um, in Dubrnich. It's in the Carpathians. And my mom was born in Redvance, which was, which was a bigger town uh, next to Ungvar, Ungvar Ushora. It changed names depending on which country ruled it. Um, my dad's family consisted of about 10 siblings, brothers and sisters, and my mom had five siblings. Um, there were also lots of aunts and uncles and cousins that lived in the area. And um, th th we heard stories as we grew up about what life was like. Both my grandparents' uh, grandfathers ran butcher shops. I don't know if they knew each other at the time, but they had really ran butcher shops. They lived a nice life. It was a Jewish life, but they were surrounded by Gentile neighbors, and they all seemed to get along for the most part. Um, when my parents, um, they both went to public school. Um, then as they would turn 13, 14, they would be sent off to do a trade, a tra apprentice for a trade, so they could be going to a cabinet maker or a grocer or a seamstress or a tailor, whatever they were going to choose to become. And they would work there for a couple, hour, couple, couple of years living there. Um, when the Nazis and the, and the Allied um, Hungarians took over Czechoslovakia and when it was 37, 38, um, Dad was already in the Czech army. And at that time, when the, uh, when the Nazis took over and basically England agreed to give Czechoslovakia to Hitler, all of the Jewish soldiers that were in the army were immediately transferred out of the army, their weapons were taken away, and they were put into slave, la slave labor camps. So that was already in the late 30s that my dad was in a slave labor camp. Uh, he was part of the time he was in, in Romania, and then other part of the time he was in the Ukraine. There's all kinds of stories that I can tell you about him, but we don't have the time to really get into much detail. But after all those years, he was finally allowed to come back to um, Dubrnich to see his parents, and then it was like months before they were all rounded up and taken to Auschwitz. So he didn't have much time growing up of a life of his own. My mom... Um, she was younger than my dad, so she 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 didn't. She lived in 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 the U in Ungvar, and um, the 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 uh, program there was. She lived and experienced all of the changes of the laws, where laws would be passed and new laws would come about. That oh, Jews can't own businesses anymore; they have to give the business to a Gentile. Oh, Jews can't do this or Jews can't do that. So lots of laws would come together. And um, I'll talk about laws in my out outlook <laughs> as far as some of the laws in this country. But in any case, um, they were, my mom was living that life where, you know, her friends that were friends with her, like they would be out at, at a dance or whatever. And um, all of a sudden, one would start saying, Jews, get out, Jews, get out. And then these friends that she grew up with who were Gentiles, they would all start saying, yeah, Jews, get out. They would just join the, join that that hatred situation. So um, it was it was a rough life for the, for my mom. There's all there's a lot of stories. They're in my book in my mom's book. But um, what what ultimately happened is um, in probably '44 is when they were taken and rounded up and sent to a, to the ghetto at the brickyard in in Ungvar. And then after being there for about six weeks, um, they were herded up and marched to the train station and loaded up into cattle cars and shipped off to Auschwitz. And um, my mom used to give the good sto get, tell her stories to a lot of the students um, here at this in this stage, and throughout many of the uh, high schools. And um, I would go there with her to talk about the stories. But anyhow, the, when she arrived at um, at Auschwitz, um, as they were getting off the train, a German SS soldier came up to my my grandfather, her my father, and basically bashed his skull in with his back of his with his rifle butt right in front of my mother because. He had grabbed his tallest bag, his bag where he had the Jewish prayer items. And so for that reason, he was killed right in front of my mom. Um, shortly thereafter, um, when they were separated out, when my mom was separated out with the women and the children, they marched them down and then they separated out the women. The women that were of an age that would be a good slave laborer. So basically, it would probably be from 14, 15 up into about 30. If they were younger than that, they would be um, sent in, the direct, in, the, in one direction, together with uh, older people and together with mothers who had young children. So the Nazis felt 
they basically were separating out who could become a, a good worker and who wouldn't be a good worker, send them to the gas chamber. And that included mothers, because they would be grieving if their child was sent to the gas chamber, so they sent them all that way too. Um, the stories that they had, both my parents, they're just amazing as they survived the camps, but I don't really have much time today to talk about that. Um, we've got, thank God, my mom was, she had woken up um, here in the United States probably in the 70s, the 1970s with a nightmare, and she decided to start writing her stories down. Prior to that, she had kept, she'd not really gone into what, what had happened to her for the most part. So I didn't really know the detail level of what, what was happening. I knew that they were, that both my parents were Holocaust survivors. Um, we grew up in, in LA and it was, a, um, it was the same situation. All of the, there are a lot of quote Ungvaris or the Jews that survived the camps that were from Ungvar area and a lot of them ended up either in New York or in Los Angeles. So um, probably five aunts and uncles, on my, including my dad, on my dad's side, and then my mom had her sister and brother that survived on her side, and then the kids. So we used to get together a lot as a family. But, but growing up, really, for me, um, I, didn't, I didn't really feel any different than other neighbors' kids. Um, I went to public school. I played Little League Baseball. We would go to the movies at the Lancashire Theater on Saturday mornings for 35 cents to watch a double feature. It was pretty cool then, to those days. Um, we interacted, and um, I don't think I ran, I didn't run into too much really um, negative interaction from neighbors. I mean, I've had people call me, you know, the Christ killer and this different things like that, at which point I said, well, I wasn't even born when Christ was killed. What, what, you know, how, how did I do that? But um, that's when I was a kid. So, so it was just, there was a lot of that type of stuff that went on, but for the most part, in this country or in LA, thank God we were accepted as as just people. Um, so I didn't I didn't really feel anything to that extent as far as being a second generation. Uh, it, it took me years later when I was working on the book with my mom when I started to really think about well what what was it like being second generation? And it was like I didn't have any grandparents. I grew up without grandparents. They were all killed. I was missing aunts and uncles and cousins in an age range from basically it, in the in, by the time that they went to the camps in the 44, anybody that was younger than 13 was killed, and anybody that was older than, let's say, 30 was killed. So there's this one gap of age of the survivors, and that's who we knew, and then, and then the kids that were born after the war. So that was a difference there. We didn't have any family heirlooms everything had been taken when they were in the camps. Their houses were, got, were taken, people, the neighbors broke into the houses, stole everything they could, um, or the government didn't. It was all quote unquote legal to do that at that time. So it's, it's, it was a rough, that, that part was a rough situation. Um, I think growing up, you know, my mom had tattoos, my dad had tattoo on his arms, the numbers that they would, the numbers that they, that the, that they were, identified with when they lost their names in the camps. And all my aunts and uncles and all the other Ungvaris also had numbers. So our group of people were, sep were different than, than yours from, from, from Austria because my family and the peers of my family, they were all concentration camp survivors. They had all survived going through the camps. They had all witnessed their families being separated, being killed, friends being murdered, killed. It was just a rough routine situation. So they didn't really, they didn't really again talk too much about what was going on. They, they told stories of, we knew that the, that the, you know, where's grandma and grandpa? Well, the Nazis killed them. That was about the extent, there was a, there was a Holocaust, we were in the camps. I would get woken up many nights by my dad screaming at night. He'd be having another nightmare of what it was like in, in Auschwitz and he'd wake, he'd be screaming and hollering and yelling. And it was really, it was unnerving, but you got used to that as a kid growing up in that situation. So that was another part that, that kind of set me apart from, I guess, other peers, other kids that, that I grew up with. Um, again, it wasn't until my mom started writing her stories, and it was also me wanting to get a, get a history of what was going on, where I, it was before Spielberg, and I got the old video eight camera, and I asked my Aunt Blanca if I could interview her, and she said, sure. 
And we sat down at the table in her house, and I set it off the camera, and I started to film her. I guess I was in college at the time. And she says, you know, I've never told the story to anybody. You're the first person really asking me. And she just started to tell her story, and it was like my jaw was dropping listening to it. And um, several of my family, you know, they, they started to open up more and more as that, uh, that time period went on. Um, as far as other influences with my family, um, uh, my brother Irv, who was born in Czechoslovakia, so af after the war, when my parents were released, that's when my dad and my mom met each other, and they, they got together in, Czechos in, in the Carpathian region of Czechoslovakia, and then they, they moved to get out of that part of Czechoslovakia because the Russians were already in that area, and they were, they were going to be taking it over, basically. And what they did do is they chopped that piece of Czechoslovakia off the map, and from that point forward, it was now the Soviet Union. It was not part of Czechoslovakia. And so they moved to a town called Tisa, which was on the west side of Czechoslovakia, and that's where they were living. And my dad opened up a deli in a market there, and you know he take care. Of, he had a, he had the nature. He learned how to survive. So he took care of the people. It wasn't just the Jewish people. It was the Gentile people. Whatever he made friends with people. He learned how to do that. He made friends with the police captain. He made friends with different people. And so um, at one time, probably in around '48. The Russians started to come into um, Tisa, and they started to go. They went to the captain, the police captain. He goes, "Hey, is there any? Was there anybody that left, or they lived in the Carpathian Mountains? Because we're wanting to find them all and bring them back." And and um, the captain said, "No, he didn't know of anybody," which was really special. And then at that point, he came and told my parents, "You guys need to get out of here because they're coming and they're looking for you." And um, thank God, my 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 uncle Leonard, my mom's older brother, he had gotten out. Just before the um, just before the um, occupate, just before the um, parent, my parents. That three minutes. He had gotten out just before, and uh, on the last, uh, I think it was on the Queen Mary, the last time it sailed out of France. He had a swastika stamped in his passport, and he joined the uh, U.S. Army and fought. And he was able to get the paperwork together and finalize that for my parents. But it took years for them to get that paperwork because they had started ahead of time. But luckily, it came together. And they were able to to escape and come to America. Um, things that that I learned from them, from my dad, it was is basically how to interact with people, different people. It didn't matter if they were rich, academic, poor, hardworking. It may, mostly it was you know if they're honest and caring people. And um, you know his, in his restaurant he had he had people come in there. He had the the North Hollywood Police Department. They would the police division. They would come and eat there. And they'd sit at the counter. It was a small restaurant. And then the Hells Angels had a motorcycle shop down the street. They'd come and eat at the, and sit at the booths. And the, um, the, the motorcycle cops would say, you know, if there's ever any problem with the Hells Angels, you just let us know and we'll take care of them. And they'd leave. And then the Hells Angels would come up to us and say, if you ever have any problem with those cops, you let us know. We'll take care of them. But it was, it was a way to interact and to learn that if you treated people with respect, didn't matter what their history was, they, they valued that for the most part. And there's a bunch of stories I can tell about that, and I'm working on that book, believe it or not. But um, have I shared this with my son? Yes, he's 16, and he knows, he knows the stories of my mom and my dad and our family. And he's given talks about it and written, written his own stories and his presentations in school. Um, my daughter Sarah's got special needs, so she, she can't understand it all, but but she's a sweetheart. So anyhow, um, does it affect, I guess one of the questions was how does this affect uh, the world in which I live in, my attitude towards the community? I'm doing, I've been doing a lot of projects, um, mostly housing projects where I've created affordable housing and stuff, and it's like uh, I'll buy a rundown property and fix it up. And my approach was similar to my dad's. It didn't matter if it was a gangbanger or a motorcycle hell's angel guy or Whoever it was, when I would come in and take over a property, it would be like, you're all, nobody's got any history with me. But from this point forward, you need to be honorable and you need to take care of the place and you need to be taking care of the neighbors. Because we bought some properties where like the mothers were afraid to let their kids play outside. And by doing that, by taking that, risk, that, that step forward, we found that a lot of these people that were, quote, scary, bad record people, they would step forward and be like, well, finally I've given a chance. So, uh, you know, I, I try to bring that into how I live. I'm trying to spread the story also about my parents, about what's going on, what went on, but 
I don't want to do it just to spread the story. I want to do it in a way that also encourages all of you and everybody else to that here's a story that under, to understand that it's not just an academic lesson of history, but it's something that, that can happen again and that each of you have the power to make a big difference in what happens in the future. Each of you have the power to, to spread the word, to tell the story. Each of you have the power and really the responsibility to, to step forward or get help if you see something bad or improper being happening to another peer or somebody else. And, and that's what's going to make a difference. Am I running out of time? Okay, I used for 15 seconds. Thank you. Hi. My story is actually, I'm going to start with my story and then go back because I never knew anything and had to do my homework to find out about my family. And I call this the daymare because this is what's been going on before I fall asleep since I've been 11 years old and now I know why I have the daymare. It begins as I turn out the lights and I prepare to settle down for the night. The room is dark, the bed is comfortable and cozy, and I eagerly await my restful sleep, but I'm still awake when a cold feeling comes over my body. I begin to feel anxious, for I know what is coming. All of a sudden, the fear takes over, visceral and terrifying. I am falling into a pit. It is, a large, it is large, emptying into an abyss that spirals downward. The spiral reaches to infinity, and my fall down this hole goes on forever, without end. I stay conscious. I begin to think that this life I know will cease, and that everything I know to be reality is, in fact, temporary. The life I live is an illusion to be shattered and end with no control on my part. I will die, it is inevitable, and the world will go on without me. My existence wiped out in an instant. Completely conscious, I am falling forever into this pit. It is my death, and it will never end. The pit is dark. The farther I fall, the smaller it gets. There's no one to help me or to save me. I must deal with it myself, as I have done since the horror began, as I have done since I was 11 years old. My father said I would outgrow it. My husband held me and said, uh, when I was a young woman, telling me that he was there with me. Now I've been having these daymares alone for over 63 years. Will they ever end? The answer, by the way, is no. At the age of 11, my father went to, uh, th this, by the way, is a story of the Holocaust by bullets, not the camps, not um, getting out in time, uh, but the story of people who sent their one son, the man to the top left, and uh, he was able to get out of the country and never spoke of anything after he left and spent most of his life in prayer, an Orthodox Jew, looking and praying and davening every night, looking for his lost loved ones, living the life of a survivor with survivor guilt, but never talked to us about what, we had experienced, what he had experienced. But when I was 11, we went to New York City. I grew up in Boston, not far from Worcester, and um, he went up into an apartment, and my brother and I were in the car for hours. He came down with my mother, and he was a broken man. He was weeping. He was hyperventilating. My mother put him in the car, and we went back to Boston from New York at that time, a seven-hour trip. Nobody talked, but we knew something horrible had happened. Never found out what happened. Fast forward many, many years later, I'm now a sociologist, I'm now working with perpetrators of violent crime, looking at evil, trying to understand people who are evil and why they do horrible things. And eventually I decided, I, I knew that we had lost our family in the Holocaust, but I didn't know any of the details. So I was a visiting scholar at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. And um, in the morning, we could learn 
uh, how to teach the Holocaust, but in the evenings or in the afternoons, we could go upstairs and do our homework on the microfilm. And so I typed in my father's village, Kupiskis, uh, Lithuania, and up came a list of all the people who had been shot that day in 19, June 28th, 1942. I was born in 1944. And there on the list finally was corroboration that my aunt, up at the top, my uncle, who was 17, and my grandmother, who at the time was 62, had been killed that day in Kupiskis. And my grandfather had died a little bit uh, a year or so earlier. I always look at this picture and think, what an attractive family they were. I used to look like my aunt. Now I look like my grandmother. Um, and but proud, by the way. And you know, uh, John was talking earlier about um, the themes that we all carry. The theme that I have to uh, reiterate is intergenerational transmission of trauma. Right? I didn't know what had happened in Lithuania, and I'll tell you the story. But by the time I was 11, I was falling into a pit in my own life, not knowing any of the details. I was a memorial candle for my family without realizing that that's what I was doing. And so when I was the, at the museum, I went upstairs, found the list of everybody who had died, called my brother quickly and said, oh my God, you'll never know what I found. Finally, a list, and it had been the public health nurse uh, from the local, from another village had come over and gone door to door, writing down all the names and the ages of the people who had perished that day. Soon thereafter, my brother, and this, by the way, would have been maybe now the 1980s, um, uh, no, it's 90s, because I was at the museum then, um, there was a New York Times article, and my brother called me and said, read this, and it was a story of a man who was about to be deported from the United States, who had participated in the atrocities that took place in Kupiskis, Lithuania. And the store, I immediately, you know, I have like this, uh, I'm an academic, I'm going to do my homework. I called the guy in the story, the lawyer uh, from the Justice Department. I said, tell me, tell me what you know. And he said, let me tell you the story. And the story was that this man, um, Bareness, had, he was the only, um, there, were, there was only one Nazi in the town that had moved in with the Einsatzgruppen, which are the roving killing teams, but they had moved on. They left one Nazi in the town and they wrote, uh, rounded up some local Lithuanians who then rounded all the Jews of that village up and marched them to their deaths in a pit outside of town. A pit. How did I know it was a pit? But I did. Collective unconscious, who knows what it was, but I knew. And, and from then I started to do my homework and I asked my father, who was still alive at the time, Dad, let's go to Lithuania. And he said in his heavy Eastern European accent, why would I wanna go there? They killed my people, right? And so he never went. But my brother and I went about five years ago, and what we discovered was that the village was still there. The town was still exactly the way it was as my father had seen it. Um, and I walked the way from the little house that they lived in, which had been torn down, out to the killing field. And as I was walking along, I thought to myself, what are they thinking? What are they feeling? They know they can hear the shots going off in the field. What's going on in their heads? Are they holding each other's hands? Are they praying? Are they weeping? What would I do in this situation? And then we get to the field, and it is a, I, usually when I do this talk, I have a picture of the field. It's beautiful gardens and there's a memorial and I think to myself I, all my life I've been expecting a pit and it's a beautiful garden field so 
all the ideas that I had of this place were sort of uh, created in my mind, but later I found out beneath this beautiful field, over 2,000 bodies were, were buried. And so it was a sacred place. And I had gone to killing fields throughout Lithuania where thousands, in Lithuania there were once 200,000 Jews and from December, sorry, yeah, from December to June of 1942, 75% of them were killed by the bullets that the Nazis and the roving killing teams took upon themselves to kill. The rest of the folks were put in, in um, ghettos where they fought back. And all the myths about Jews going willingly to their deaths is a myth because there were underground uh, safety places that they could hide, they could go into the gutters, they could go into the sewers. They went out of the ghetto and then came back into the ghetto with food and tried to survive it. They were not um, going willingly unto their deaths. So as a result of all, and, and I remember my father saying to me, don't go there, Elaine. They're anti-Semites. You won't, they won't treat you well. And I get to the village and I wasn't treated well. Uh, it turns out there was an incident at the bus station where we had to use the bathroom and uh, there was a miscommunication. And at one point, there were about seven of us in this little van uh, doing our little roots tour to the villages uh, where we had been, our families came from. And the woman who ran the, um, the bus station said, oh, Yidden, get out of here, get out of here. Jews, go away. This was five years ago, right? And so the thing you said about anti-Semitism is alive and well. I, I think you all know that it's on the rise in the United States again. It's been cre increased within the last two years, 250%. So we see anti-Semitism worldwide. Now, as a result of all of my family trauma and background, I find myself drawn to the dark side. When in doubt, I'll work with prisoners and perpetrators and, and I don't, I'm not interested in victims. I want to understand what motivates people to participate in atrocities. And having worked now with people in prison, I understand it. You all heard the wonderful lecture with Christopher Browning. He describes to you that kind of socialization process that takes place where people can begin to become desensitized and agree to go along with things they might not otherwise do. And so um, I'm learning and trying to educate through programs such as this, as well as teaching in public schools and writing, to try to reach more and more people. Part of being a memorial candle for me was the building of the Holocaust and Genocide Memorial Grove. Is that my time? Okay, I'm almost done. Um, and at that, I urge you to take a walk. How many of you have been out there? Not enough. Check it out, it's gorgeous. It's on the way to the GMC on the east side of the lakes and just walk there. And now there's a new circle of trees and there's a map that we can uh, let you see that uh, the Alliance has out at the table uh, in which a woman who really loved the Anne Frank tree, we have a cutting from the Anne Frank tree from Amsterdam that is now growing on our campus. Uh, as a result of that, um, she donated money for more trees because trees are life. And so we have a circle of trees for life, 18 of them because in the Jewish religion, 18 means life. And so she's a Polish refugee and uh, she's donated to this campus. So we are a center for, through this program, through the Grove, through all of this that's been going on, a center for education, and I'm proud to be a part of it and be a memorial candle. Thank you.